Welcome to the Better Business, Better Life show. I'm your podcast host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor. In this podcast, I interview business owners, EOS implementers, and business experts who share with you their experiences, tips, and tools to help you create not only a better business, but also a better life. At the end of each show, you will have three tips or tools that our guests share that you can implement immediately into your life. If you want more information or want to get in contact, you can visit my website, debra.coach. That's D-E-B-R-A dot coach. Please enjoy the show. And today I am joined by Matt or Matthew Davis, who is a CEO and owner of Davis Business Law, which is actually a law firm practice over in the US that's got eight branches, 16 lawyers, and I'm, I'm guessing a whole team of support staff as well. Welcome to the show, Matthew. Thank you. It's it's great to be on a New Zealand show. It's, you know, expanding my worldwide reach after Tasmania and England <laughs> and Australia, so it's fun. You've been you've been to all of the kind of the the, the main British speaking countries outside of the US, from the sounds of it. <laughs> yes, the, the Anglo sphere, as we call it. So. Excellent. Oh, good. Hey, look, um, I, I know that you're a lawyer by trade, but you're a lot more than that, right? Because you're actually an entrepreneur. Um, you have built this business up from this from the ground up. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey to get to where you are now and a little bit about how that's been? Well, I'm, I'm kind of not joking when I tell people I had a midlife crisis and started a law firm, which is, you know, better than okay. a lot of, lot of other things, or a lot more constructive than things that a lot of guys do. I, uh, I, I was a lawyer in a, in a small city in my, my hometown, which I, I like living. Everybody's like, why do you live out there? I'm like, because I like my three minute commute. And um, hmm. uh, one day I, I stumbled onto a, a coaching company and they said, why don't you go start, start a law firm? And I said, okay. And, and I had a great practice. Okay. But a practice is different than a business. You know, a practice mm -hmm, is let's sure. take care of professional services all day long. And, you know, I had a very sophisticated marketing strategy for that practice in that I wasn't in the phone book. I didn't have a web page, so I'm joking when it was sophisticated. There was I had no marketing strategy. I just had repeat business. And all of a sudden, one day, it just sort of snapped, and I turned that practice into a law business. And here we are eight years later and 30-some um, employees. And we, we grow at about 30% a year, and we just map it out and figure out how to go do it. Lovely. Well, that's that's awesome. And so, what was that um, that moment that that made you decide to change from being just a practice into being a business? Um, I was at, at, at one of the um, conferences, and um, I, I just I, I was talking to some other lawyers, and they said, "Well, why don't you go, go grow your practice into a business?" And it, it was it was really kind of that simple. And you know, lawyers mm. tend not to think business-wise. I mean, I've always been a business lawyer. I've taught business law and so on. But I, I had just never spent a lot of time thinking about it because I always made a good living. And um, then it just sort of struck me one day. And um, I, 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 was, I didn't have any staff at that point in time because I just downsized. And I tell a lot of business people that. I say there's, there's two ways to make money. Good money in business, stay really small and tight or grow it. And the middle is not pleasant because, you know, in the middle, you're adding a lot of non revenue staff. And, um, you know, my friend Greg Crabtree, who wrote Simple Numbers, calls that the Badlands. And yeah, I really think that's true. But um, I completely agree. I mean, I think people sort of think that, oh, I don't want to get my business any bigger because it'll become more complicated. I have more staff. But actually, as it gets bigger, it becomes easier. Truth. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's true. Mm -hmm. Except, you know, and I think you're, we're not disagreeing. It's that middle part. Um, Crabtree maps it out in America, maybe between one point five to three or four million dollars in revenue. You know, you're, you, at that point, you're starting to add um, your probably COO function, your um, CFO function, probably some bookkeeping, maybe HR. 
And, you know, those, those are expensive positions to fill. But as the owner of the business, you just can't do all those things once you start to grow it. And um, mm-hmm. so, yeah, that, that middle's unpleasant. And, and you know, I, I can tell you from personal experience, it was really unpleasant for us. And then confirming what you just said, once we've gotten past that, yeah, my life is a lot better. Mm. Love it. Now, I'm just like making a look at my notes here that we had a, a quick chat about. You're um, also an author. I forgot to mention that in our introduction. So you have written a book called Preventing Stupid. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's Okay. So that book's called The Art of Preventing Stupid. And um, yep. you can grab it on Amazon. And it's it's what it is, is it's a book about teaching um business owners or managers, how to think about preventing problems, preventing business problems before they strike. Um, Because Mm -hmm. one of my thoughts is uh, there's just not that much new under the sun. It's, you know, the same business problems happen time and time and time again. But business owners tend to be very aggressive going forward and with their, if what they, you know, about their strengths and their opportunities, but they tend not to think very much about their weaknesses and their threats or their vulnerabilities. And so as a business lawyer, trying to be proactive with our clients, we say, okay, guys, let's tap the break and let's develop some tools, which is what that book's about, of how you can brainstorm and then develop a plan of dealing with those vulnerabilities so you can capitalize on your opportunities. Hmm. Okay, so what do you think are some of the biggest mistakes that businesses tend to make? Well, um, you know, the, the easy one that we see all the time is getting into business with people that you don't need to get into business with. Because, you know, you're you're starting a business, you're apprehensive, you're a little concerned, you're scared, you're intimidated. And um, so you'll bring somebody else in and you think it's shoring up your strength or your weaknesses. And my thought is that's generally just complicating your life. Um, So we are, unless it's a sophisticated set of people working together who um, have done, you know, several businesses. Wow. We, we really discourage people from doing that uh, because we see it all the time. And we do a lot of business divorces, and which is you know, not a formal legal name, but that's what it is, you know? Yeah. So you're talking about people specifically who go out and, and find a co-founder or an investor or somebody who wants to come into the business in a formal um, relationship sharing kind of perspective as opposed to having an employee, right? Exactly. And, um, mm-hmm. and you know, that kind of dovetails in to um, how one of, one of the core things that we teach uh, and, and that I teach and, and my team teaches in working with businesses, there's three main things you need to brainstorm about, about how to protect Mm -hmm. yourself. And one is the catastrophes. You could call it the sucker punches, the disasters, you know, pick pick a word. I call it catastrophes. You know, just what, what are the things that you need to either prepare for or prevent? And that let's, let's book in that category. Now, the second category of things you need to brainstorm about, is what are you ignorant about? Which is really just a maybe more negative way of saying what skill sets do you need to acquire to get where you want to go in your business? And Mm -hmm. I I call that ignorance because I'm I'm trying to agitate business owners. I'm trying to go, come on, guys, let's prevent these stupid mistakes, right? And so let's go in a brainstorm about catastrophes, brainstorm about ignorance, and, and, you know, one thing people will do that's really unconstructive is let's bring somebody in that we just need for a short time when maybe we really just need a consultant or maybe we just need to go to Amazon or to the local bookstore and buy every book we can about the subject until we understand it. And 
understand mm -hmm. how to acquire that skill set. By the way, the third thing we teach people to look for is when when, when they're being inept, and which is really when you're starting to slack off on the skills you already have and you're just getting sloppy. Um, right. So I guess what I'm getting to is we, we – and we plug in – with a lot of EOS and scaling up coaches mm -hmm. where you all are strategic planning. We kind of do the negative planning of what can go wrong. Mm -hmm. If that makes yeah. sense. Perfect sense. Yep. <laughs> so you're really aware of the EOS and the scaling up structure. Um, and that's, what I think what I was asking the question is like, you're talking about, Obviously, in the business, we do need to build up that team of people who are going to support us to grow from being a sole practitioner to being a, a true business. But it's really when you get into relation, um, legal relationships with people, so shareholdings, found co-founders, that kind of stuff, where it is just like a marriage, right? And I think we, we tend not to approach it necessarily in the same way. I mean, you wouldn't go and marry somebody without spending a fair amount of time um, dating them, understanding that you share the same kind of values, that you've got the same vision in life and that you want the same things. Um, and then after you've dated, you might get engaged for a while and then eventually you'll get married. Whereas in business, people, I think what you were saying is they sort of see they've got this this uh, weakness or this gap that they need to fill and they bring somebody in um, to fill it when maybe it was just a short-term thing. Maybe it was, you know, they didn't need to bring them in as a partner in the business. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Uh, you, yes, you, you, you hit it exactly on the head. And um, yeah, and then, you know, you're there together, you're, you're in the business together. And, you know, by metaphor, somebody's not doing the dishes and you get sick of doing all their dishes and cleaning up all their messes. And they're not taking out the trash, but they're still taking half the profits if, you know, if, if they're 50-50 owners and, you know, then you've got disputes about who's getting what salary even before the profits. Oh, it's just a nightmare. And um, <laughs> again, there's there's exceptions to that rule. But as, as a general rule, particularly with startups, gosh, we discourage people from doing that. Yeah. I know that when I work, I mean, I used to do a lot of work with startups, not so much these days, but in the, in the past, I would actually, you know, I'd say to them, you've got to treat this as seriously as a marriage. And you need to be really, really careful because like you said, if when it, if and when it ends, it's going to be like a divorce. And so you need to know what you're getting yourself into um, before you get into it. So I love that uh, yeah. analogy. <laughs> that's, that's why we call it a business divorce. You know, it's a colloquialism. <laughs> If I, I think I said that word right. So it's a yeah, big word. Yeah, for me. absolutely. <laughs> it is. So, what are the other kind of mistakes that people sort of tend to make um, when they're? Because uh, I think you you've done the classic thing. I mean, with the E Myth Revisit, it talks about moving away from being a technician to actually growing a business, and you've done that very successfully with your law firm. What are some of the the challenges and potential um, risks that people need to look out for when they're on that journey? Wow, and that's yeah, that's funny. I was just talking about e myth um, the other well the other day. I was thinking about it yesterday, and um, and yeah, and I was thinking about it yesterday because incidentally, I I kind of um, I still do a little technical work um, even even with the size that we are, but for what that's worth. So that I had e myth on the brain here today because. I spent a lot of, lot of time doing technical work. But part of the reason I do that is, look, I'm in a professional services firm, and mm -hmm. my, my team likes it when I'm in the mix. Um, you know, when, <clears throat> when I'm bringing on a new attorney or new staff, they, they like to work with me. They like to get um, part of the culture. And maybe that's the, really the question I'm getting to, are going to, the answer that I'm getting to with your culture, or with your question is one of the big things is building your culture and understanding who you are and not being afraid to you know, just to be who you are and to be the leader and to go, okay, guys, this is who we are. These are our values. And then to find those people that share the same values and like to work like you because we we take great pains of going and hunting for lawyers 
that that share our values of you know believing and protecting our clients' dreams and creating solutions because we don't want problem bringers. Everybody hates problem bringers, right? You know, our clients mm-hmm. need practical solutions. You know, well, most of our clients are small business people. They don't have a budget like Exxon or BP. And, um, and, and those are two of our four core values. But we are really serious about who, you know, what our core values are, what our culture is, and who we let on the team. I mean, I've sifted through 100 resumes for attorneys in one of the cities in Texas, I've talked to two of them. Yep. And you know, because it's, you could naturally see there wasn't a fit, or, or why? Why is that? Yeah, I can see they're not a fit, and and they, you know, there's some skill set components because we we need kind of Swiss Army knife attorneys, meaning people who can do some paperwork and people who aren't afraid to go to the courthouse if we need to. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's a little bit of a, it's not that rare of a skill set. And we also just don't hire baby lawyers. So, you know, 25 okay. of those hundred are baby lawyers. I'm going to let somebody else train them. And then once they're, okay. once they're sick of those big law firms, they can come work for us because we'll treat them better. <laughs> So how do you ensure that somebody does share your values? Because, you know, it's absolutely fundamental, I believe, to have people who who share those core values, who are on the journey with you, who want to be part of that journey. But how do you kind of test that? How do you make sure that you've got people that genuinely will fit into your culture? We use two books in our recruiting. One is Jeff Smart's Who. And his dad was Brad Smart, who wrote Top Grading. And Top Grading kind of reads like the Old Testament, and who kind (laughs) of reads like the New Testament. So I I, I use that analogy. Um, and And the real simple principle there is the leopards don't change their spots. You know, you can see how people, they, they stay the same over the course of their lives. And... You know, I, I got a resume today was kind of promising, but this woman had changed jobs every year for the last five years. I'm like, why would I bother, you know, investing in you? You know, it's mm-hmm. come on. Okay, so that the other book we use is one called Hiring for Attitude by Mark Murphy. And um, it's fantastic. Um our ad is so crazy when we, you know, when we run it in with the bar associations or on LinkedIn. Um, it's a, you know, most law firm ads like, would you like to wear a gray suit and be torment humanity or whatever? And they're just and prestigious yeah. law firm, you know, and it's like just playing to their ego. And ours yeah. reads, you know, very conversationally, would you actually like to help people? And work with people you love, or you know, it's almost like this. And and it, literally, there's a line in there that says, "And we don't hire any Eors," as in you know, Eor from mm-hmm. Winnie the Pooh, because we don't hire yeah, yeah. people. And <laughs> so when I mean, there are half the team saw that ad and said, "That's where I want to work." Period. Amen. And then you know, we have to deliver on that. And, and, you know, we, we, we really work hard to deliver on that. But that, that's our culture. That's who we are. And um, so, you know, they, it starts with recruiting. And I, I really do commend those two books. We spend a lot of time um, on that. And then, you know, a couple recruiting pointers. Um, we always do an initial interview on Zoom because it's just efficient and and you know just an initial 30 minute get acquainted we don't do it by phone because you just pick up so much more and we're always real clear about this is a lesson learned the hard way that we check references before we set a more formal interview because you know you're gonna you're gonna hear things 
And um, th- th- those are those are important important things to do when when we're recruiting because you know one one issue is if once you start recruiting you can start to get invested in the person and we you know when we find somebody says hey these skill sets look good they look like they're a good fit and I'm just talking really about attorneys now um, then. We, we're at that point. We're kind of looking for reasons to say no, um, because I can tell from experience what people, you know, have done and how it could plug in with us. And and I like people, and my COO likes people, but we have learned that you know we just kind of want to take everybody and bring them into the tribe, but we have to look for reasons to say no and. We just went through a long recruiting process with an attorney going into a new market and we walked away because we just we had four or five reasons to say no. And we were like, hey, you know, he's just not a cultural fit. And the issue there was we didn't think he was a hard worker at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And, and we work hard because we like what we do. So we you know, it's it's kind of not work for us because it's fun. And, and it's cool seeing people grow and make something out of their lives. Hmm. Okay, cool. So you're very, very careful about people before they come on board. And I think, I think that's actually a really important point that you said is that sometimes we get really invested in the process and, and you need to actually check those references reasonably early on because you will it'll highlight any red flags before you get too invested and before you kind of you know feel like you um you're already uh, entering into a relationship so yeah i like that i like that a lot and i'm actually quite keen to look at the, the who book yeah <laughs> yeah one more thing and we always talk about money in the first interview yep. because you know we do a little sales of us and mm-hmm. then the question, this, I, I'm kind of proud of this question. So are you interested in this opportunity? First question. They say, yes. I say, what sort of compensation level would it take to keep you interested in this mm-hmm. opportunity? And then, you know, they answer and they, they may him and haul and you can say, okay, send me an email and let me know. But, um, that has proven to be a really powerful question because the other thing is we don't want to waste anybody's time if if it's just not a financial fit for for anybody. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense, and I think it's um, I mean even coming down to the job advert, I think is one of the most important things. Even sort of being honest in the job advert about what the the job really entails, what it what our culture really is like, and potentially that kind of salary range can can really help people because I always think a job advert's role is not only to attract the people that you want but actually to repel the people that you don't you actually want somebody reading that advert and going you know what that doesn't sound like me at all I'd hate that (laughs) oh yeah I mean all the jerks that went to law school and there's a lot of them they see my ad and they go I hate that guy and I'm like I hate you too so stay away (laughs) <laughs> and that's what culture's all about right being no but it's, well, it's about being authentic it's like actually this is who we are and, and if you don't like that then we're not a fit that's okay <laughs> yeah and that's yeah that's so important it's it's and it's and it's been a real real key to our success and you know our staying power is is really amazing with the you know the length of, of that the attorneys stay with as compared to how they just move around in the law business. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm really fascinated, you know, that this whole journey that you've gone on from being a sole practitioner to having a large business, have you put any kind of business operating systems in your business? Because we've talked about EOS scaling up. What's your experience around the the business side of it? (laughs) I know this is a little heretical here, but we run Mm -hmm. scaling up. Um, just because we, we started, well, our second business coach was a scaling up coach. Um, yep. now I will, I'm going to pay you and your, and EOS a compliment because I work with a lot of, a lot of my clients and, and then 
almost everybody in my entrepreneurs organization chapter run EOS. And about everybody, um, and, and, well, in a couple groups that I'm in, almost everybody runs EOS. And I'm constantly kind of looking over the fence going, wow, that's pretty awesome. And, and so yeah. um, I, I could real easily be persuaded. But we are devotees of um, uh, right now of, um, of, of scaling up. And I'll tell you what, we were, we were talking about the differential between the two at my EO forum meeting the other day. So that's Entrepreneurs Organization. In, in case yeah, I'm, I actually um, work closely with them, yep. <laughs> yeah, and um, the one, I think there's a lot of, um, I, I, there's the one thing that I think, I think EOS has a lot of things, overscaling up. The, the one bit that we really have got a lot out of with, with scaling up is the function accountability chart. And this it's just this idea of boiling everybody's responsibility down to just basically one word. I am responsible for revenue. I am responsible for expenses. So like my responsibility for the firm is I am responsible for growth. Now that means recruiting and marketing, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. So, and right now we're, we're growing so quickly that we're, all the leadership team is talking about how to parse out those those their functions. So I will spin off recruiting next year uh, because mm -hmm. I, I'm a I'll likewise a, a believer in Simon Sinek's line of marketing is too important to leave to the marketing department. The short answer to your question is we run EO, but I'm a big fan of EOS too. Hey, look, and I, I've actually, um, I've also trained in scaling up. I, I think that actually it's a great system. And I, I, I honestly say that to people and we don't mind. You, one of my biggest thing is pick a system, stick to it, use it. That's how you'll grow your business. Uh, if you want to pick and pick and choose and take bits from here and bits from there, that's when things start to fall over. So yeah, I, I agree that scaling up is an awesome system. Personally, I prefer EOS, but that doesn't mean that, you know, it's, it's horses for courses. I, I I I just might as well too. I'm looking at my copy of Traction right over here. So uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, maybe one day we'll convert you. But in the meantime, I'm really pleased to hear. I mean, this is the thing that I'm really passionate about. Is that um, you know we we put if you think go back to our original analogy, you put a lot of time and effort into building your personal relationship and what your um, you know family life looks like and what you're doing. It's important that we have the same kind of thing in our business. You know, actually thinking about the future, thinking about who we need to have on that journey with us. How do we create the right structure to actually execute on that? And because when you're an entrepreneur, your business life and your personal life are so kind of intertwined, it's really important to have a bit of structure in both so that you can enjoy both. Yeah, and that, I, I completely agree. It's It's been invaluable to us. Um, and it's, it's just one of the reasons we, we grow as quickly as we do. And... Um, and, and similarly, I mean, we, we don't make a lot of really dumb, unforced errors because we also play really good defense with the tools that we have. And, you know, again, my first book, which is, is largely about that, I'm, I'm, one of my rocks for this quarter is to dust off the two-year-old you know, manuscript for the second book and get that out. So. Ah. So what, what's the second book? Well, have you got a title for it yet, or do you know what it's? Um... Right now it's called The Strong Protected Business, and it's building on the same tools and ultimately building it out into a plan that then dovetails into your EOS or EO strategic planning. And it, mm -hmm. it just, it's, it's, it's further elaboration. It's looking at the elephant from a different angle. Uh, I love it. My my whole thing is the elephant in the room. It's a people always sit with photos of elephants and things. And I think that's what you're you're doing. Is we it's all very well having the the beautiful vision about where we're headed, but you have to be aware of the opportunities and the issues and challenges. And and by having that awareness of everything, it just means you can make better strategic decisions, doesn't it? Yeah, and you know Jim Collins talked about that in. Um, 
Gosh, I can't remember, you know, maybe it was great by choice. Good. Yeah, it's a great, or built, yeah, great by choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He talks about that as as being productive paranoia. That the ten x leaders are constantly going, "Where's this? You know, where's it all going to go wrong? What what don't we get here?" And um, mm-hmm. and and that's that's really yeah. It's that's that's what we do. That's you know that's one of the strengths we bring to the table for our clients. Aside from just traditional law. Business law for stuff, yeah. I think, and I think it's really interesting because people sort of say, you know, but if I'm focusing on the negative, um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a negative. And it's like, no, actually, that's, it, it's really important that you have a complete view of everything. And as you said, those 10 ex-leaders, they are thinking about what have we missed. So if we're always just focusing on the positive, it's a real danger that we're missing out on those, those crocodiles, those elephants, those things that are going to actually bite us. That that is our our experience, and you know, but uh, my experience is the the companies that do that are the ones that are the strongest players on the field, and they just dominate the field. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah. Um, speaking of Jim Collins, have you seen the the BE two point which is is it's it's a reissue of one of his. Sorry, I'm kind of off on a tangent, but you're. Oh, you're this is cool. Yeah, go go for it. <laughs> yeah. so Be 2.0 is a reissue of his first book, and his first book didn't get a whole lot of. Uh, in a, it, did, it didn't make a splash like Good to Great, but in yeah. this Be 2.0, he augmented it or added to it, and, and then he put in this little chart, and he goes. You know, I finally figured out everything that I've been writing about for 35 years fits into this one little chart. And I'm like, that's fantastic, because now it all makes so much more sense. So I have it sitting right up here on my wall. And um, okay. so yeah, I, I would commend a quick look at that. Uh, it, it really helped me understand Jim Collins's work better. And, yeah. and, you know, we, whenever we do our strategic planning, that's part of, okay, how are we doing with the lessons that Collins teaches of, okay, mm-hmm. yeah, are, are we doing a 20 mile march? Are we practicing productive paranoia and, and all those elements? Uh, okay, I'm definitely, I have not looked at that, so I'm definitely going to have a look at that. So that is BE 2.0, and that chart is in there. Beautiful. Okay, so you, you've you obviously can, you've, you've done really well with your, your business. You've gone through the ups and downs of, of, of leading a business. What would be the three kind of key things you would share with the listeners? What are your three kind of top tips or tools that you've taken from oh, that journey so far? <laughs> oh, boy. Well, and the funny thing is I was just at a family reunion with my cousin, and we were he's thinking about buying a business up in Denver. And Ooh. one thing I always teach young entrepreneurs, he got this because he's a PhD engineer. He said, figure out your word problem. Now, Jim Collins maybe calls it your smack recipe. And, oh, yeah. and what that is, is figure out what your business has to do to be successful. And, you know, we all hated word problems in school. You know, if Jane is traveling at 25 miles an hour and she has to get to Wellington, right? Okay. How, you know, how, how, or how many, you would say kilometers probably. Kilometers, and, of course, yeah, but I get it. Yeah, <laughs> right. And so, you know, how, how many hours will it take her to get, you know, right? But I, I mean, I have my word problem up here and some of it's qualitative, some of it's quantitative and, you know, it's higher A players, um, and then get the attorneys, and I'll just say X leads in a new market, Y leads in mm-hmm. an established market, um, close at 30%, um, utilize, which means make sure they're billing, you know, 95%. And, and I, you know, I just walk through the, you know, what, what the numbers have to look like for us to be successful. And when you figure that out, then you can start to measure it and then you can start to manage it. And Mm -hmm. that's just so important to understand, you know, what that long chain of of numbers. And there's again, there's always some qualitative things in there, what those look like. Um, So that's that's a bit of advice I always give entrepreneurs. 
The other one, or number two, would be really learn how to delegate and understand the difference between delegation and abdication. So <laughs> abdication is, oh, I don't want to do this. I'm going to give this to somebody. Just, just go handle it. Now, delegation is, okay, here's what we need to do. This is the job function that needs to get done. And here's your KPI, your key performance indicator. Go figure out how to achieve this. And I'm here to support you, but I need a report back. And, and you know, so give me this report every week or every month. So, for instance, our COO, his job is his, I, you know, his, on his door, I am responsible for attorney productivity. And, you know, his KPI is you know, getting this many number of hours out of the attorneys, you know, making sure that we're hitting a, a good percentage of productivity and that we're just not wasting time. And, you know, and so he reports back every week and we've got just a variety of reports like that. Um, and our, our call intake is I want 95% of the calls or what not I want, the firm needs 95% of the calls on the phone of new leads on the phone with an attorney immediately. Because if we do that, 40% of the time we get the business. If not, it's 10%. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's that's a delegation versus an abdication. Yeah. Here's a complete... it's one of my little pet, pet hobbies. It's because I think I've, I've, done, I've been guilty of it in the past where you, yeah, abdication is where you kind of go, I, I don't want to do this. Somebody else needs to do it. But part of the delegation is also making sure that the person has got the right training, the right resources, all those things that come with it, but being really clear about the outcomes that you want and supporting yeah. them to achieve it, right? And yeah, and, and you know, and then, you know, the report gives you, you know, it's a spot check. You can come back, you can. Hey, okay. How do we do this? How do we? You know, how, let me let me figure out how I can help you. What tools do you need? What learn? You know, what skill sets do you need to acquire? Mm -hmm. And um, the third one here's here's your wild card answer. We take okay. great care of our team's spouses and significant others because yep. um, I think. I think it's Mark Murphy. He talks about how employees always have shoves out of your company and tugs back into your company. And if you can, um, so we do retreats twice a year. We take spouses, we take significant others and, you know, we wine them, we dine them, we have parties, we have, and, and the reason is because I don't want to take my employees and have a spouse at home with a bunch of bratty kids who now hates us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would rather them going, oh, you know, Davis Business Law took me on a free vacation. And, and, and you know, it, it's one of the craziest, simplest things that costs us a few thousand dollars a year. And now we've got advocates at our employees' homes. Who are saying, yeah. this is the best place you ever worked. Why, why would you ever leave? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? But I think you're right. It is They are forgotten about quite regularly. Um, and yet they, they're the support network for your employees. They're the people who will, um, you know, allow them to work late occasionally, allow them to, um, you know, do their work and be in the right um, headspace as well because, you know, your home life very much affects how you actually perform and, and show up at work. Yeah, I was I was just in Kansas City yesterday, and uh, I took boxes of chocolates to all of our attorneys, and I said, "These are not for you." And they, they, this happened to be two men. I said, "These are for your wife," <laughs> and yeah. they can share them with you on their discretion. But tell them I'm thanking them for letting us borrow you. Mm -hmm. And Beautiful. so, yeah, yeah. They, they, they tend to like Love me. Okay. <laughs> That's really cool. Hey, look, there's some really, really good tips there. So, you know, figure out your word problem, your smack recipe, learn how to delegate, not abdicate. So be very clear about what you're wanting the person to achieve. And then, yeah, take care of the, the team's 
spouses and significant others because then you've got a cheerleading squad back in their home who's going to want them to continue to work with you which is yeah. always a good thing cool well we've had quite a lot of covered quite a lot of things in there i mean we talked about the three main things like you know recognizing catastrophes and disasters what are you ignorant about when are you being inept they're the three kind of key areas that you help businesses to focus on and putting that in conjunction with an operating system obviously means that you get that strength in your business which is mm. just amazing Hey, Matt, I've really appreciated your time. Thank you very much for spending the time with me this afternoon for you. Um, if people want to get hold of you and they want to get your book and we're looking forward to the second one coming out, of course, how would they do that? Yeah, the website's davisbusinesslaw.com and my web or my email is just mdavis at davisbusinesslaw. And yeah, I, I answer emails. I, I don't, I'm not one of those guys with like 7,000 emails. I, I'd like 10 emails in my inbox because I just stay on top of it. It drives me crazy. A book's available on yeah. Amazon. Yeah, and that's the art of preventing stupid, yeah? yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Hey, Matt, again, thank you so much for your time. I'm, I'm a bit envious of your inbox, if I'm honest. I have not managed to start off of mine. That's one of those things I need to work on, I think. <laughs> but um, as, as you said, more than welcome to, to email Matt. He'd be happy to help you. Um, yeah, thank you for your time. Sounds great. Thank you. It's fun being on. Thanks for listening to the podcast show, Better Business, Better Life. My name is Deborah Chantry-Taylor. I'm an EOS implementer, family business advisor, business and leadership coach, podcaster, and speaker. However, I'm also a business owner with several current business interests. I'm fortunate to have lived the high life with all the lifestyle, the toys, you name it, and then I've lost it all, not only once, but twice in two spectacular train wrecks. I know what it's like to experience the highs and lows. I came across EOS when they launched into New Zealand using my Entrepreneur's Playground and Event Centre in Parnell, Auckland. I love the simplicity of the tools and their philosophies fitted my personal brand statement perfectly. The brilliance is in the simplicity. I've always been passionate about seeing entrepreneurs lead a life they love, and now I help them live that EOS life. Doing what they love, with people they love, making a huge difference in the world, being compensated appropriately and with time to pursue other passions. If you want more information or want to get in contact about using EOS in your business, you can visit my website at debra.coach. That's www.debra.coach. Thanks for listening.